A very warm welcome to the first lecture of the course on quantum technology and quantum phenomena in macroscopic systems. As the title of the course suggests that this is a course on quantum mechanics applied to the macroscopic systems and the manipulation of these macroscopic systems for various applications. The outline of this introductory lecture is as follows. Firstly, I will give you a brief historical background of quantum technology. Then I will discuss about the core structure and course plan. It will be followed by informing you about various source materials based on which this course is structured. Finally, I will briefly remind you about some important postulates and mathematical tools of quantum mechanics. This will be helpful for those who are not in touch with quantum mechanics for a long time. You know that quantum mechanics as a conceptual subject is very strange. In fact, Niels Bohr, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, said that without getting dizzy, one can't properly understood quantum mechanics. Arwin Schrodinger, who contributed so immensely for the development of quantum mechanics, even said later in his life that I don't like it and I am sorry I ever had anything to do with it. And you know, Finman famously said, anyone who thinks they know quantum mechanics does not. In spite of conceptual bizarreness, not a single experiment so far has proved quantum mechanics to be wrong. Rather, quantum mechanics turns out to be quite useful for various technological applications. In a way, it has brought revolution to technology. Quantum mechanics principles are behind the development of lasers, atomic clocks, GPS, the entire field of electronics and computers that we see all around us, internet and even mobile communications. In all these technologies, the role of quantum mechanics is a bit indirect as the system under consideration are not manipulated in the quantum domain. As regards the manipulation of energy levels of atoms, scientists were restricted by the God-given elements which we know are enlisted in the periodic table. So they are limited by these elements only and one does not have too much of freedom as energy levels of these neutral atoms can be altered or shifted by very tiny amount via application of electric field. You may recall about the Stark effect in this case or the magnetic field. You may recall about Zeeman, Zeeman effect. And artificial atoms were still to be discovered uh, in the 70s or 60s. However, since 1980s, due to enormous progress in technology and thanks to persistent research by some research groups, it were possible to trap single ion or even trap photons in a cavity, which led to the control of individual quantum systems. Two research groups led by one by Sergei Herose and the other by David J. Weinland. Weinland contributed hugely towards manipulation of individual quantum systems. Their work in fact revolutionized the technological application aspects of quantum physics. And very deservingly, they were awarded the 2012 Physics Nobel Prize. In fact, their works were partly responsible for huge resurgence of research development and towards development of quantum computers. Today, we are said to be in the domain of second generation of quantum technology, where quantum mechanics is going to play direct role in various applications such as quantum sensors, quantum information processing, novel quantum materials, quantum cryptography, and even in the so-called quantum internet. At the core of the quantum technology are the so-called engineered quantum systems such as superconducting, electronic circuits, 
micro and nano mechanical systems quantum dots and so on in this course we will focus on superconducting circuits which are discussed as a topic under circuit quantum electrodynamics some of you may be aware that google's latest quantum computer is based on superconducting circuits apart from superconducting circuits we will study micro and nano mechanical systems they are discussed under the umbrella of cavity optomechanics these systems has numerous applications in fact the ligo in fact the ligo lars uh, which is basically the abbreviation for the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory in reality is a large cavity optomechanical system to understand these systems one needs to know the tools of both quantum optics and condensed matter physics and this is the major goal of this course to familiarize you with the essential tools as i said in this course we will focus on circuit qed and cavity optomechanics circuit qed will be covered in module 2 and cavity optomechanical system will be discussed in module 3 in module 1 we will build up most essential basics right from scratch this course is essentially application of quantum optics to condensed matter system and we will discuss all the basics no knowledge of quantum optics is needed however a familiarity with basic quantum mechanics will be helpful but may not be essential the useful components of the course are that we are going to have supplementary materials time to time which will help you to some of you to familiarize with the concept some concept uh, maybe you have forgotten or maybe you would like to uh, learn it a little bit in more depth so supplementary materials will hopefully compensate those things and all the lecture materials would be supplemented by problem solving sessions after every three four lectures we will have problem solving session in this problem solving session sometimes some uh, derivation steps for example which may skip in the lecture maybe we will complete that in the problem solving sessions and these sessions are going to be useful because uh, you will have confidence as you solve more and more problems and we will have easy to do assignments based on class lectures no need for uh, remembering the derivations you just need to understand how uh, things are work out so steps are necessary to do but for examination purposes you need not have to bother about long derivations the source materials uh, on which this course is relied on are taken from research papers books and even from internet for quantum mechanics you may look at the book by uh, the elementary book by david griffiths fourth edition has come up apart from that there is a little bit uh, on the higher side uh, that book is by sakurai's modern quantum mechanics and for quantum optics you may look at introductory quantum optics by gary and knight and there's a, another nice book by Greenberg and Aspect uh, Introduction to Quantum Optics uh, it is written by actually three authors uh, Gilbert Greenberg, Align Aspect and Claude Faber and this book is a bit advanced that is Quantum Optics by Giris S. Agarwal and this book is used to discuss some materials in module 3 uh, where we are going to discuss cavity quantum optomechanics also i will rely on uh, or materials i will take from florian markward's lectures marcus espelmeyer and i will use some notes by uh, miskatul bhattacharya who uh, is my friend and he has kindly given me shared some notes with me i will use some of them and i will also use uh, for circuit qed I will use lectures by Stephen M. Girvin and also the Kiskit Global Summer School lectures by Zlatko Minev. And there is a very good book on quantum optomechanics. Uh, this book is on advanced side, but once you complete the 
module three, you will be able to understand lots of the stuffs uh, in this book. This book is called Quantum Optomechanics, uh, written by uh, Bowen, Warwick, Warwick P. Bowen, and Zerad Zemi. Let me now remind you about some basic quantum mechanics quickly. While in reality, quantum mechanics happens in laboratory or actual life, as put by the quantum physicist S.R. Paris, to discuss quantum mechanics, we generally rely on the abstract Hilbert space. As you know, that in classical mechanics, which I am going to write shortly as CM, the state of a system, state of a system or a particle is defined by the position and velocity or momentum at a given instant of time so position let me denote it by q velocity by q dot that is the time derivative of q and momentum is generally denoted by the symbol p so if we know the position and momentum of a particle at a given instant of time then in principle we can predict the past and future of the system by using Newton's laws of motion. However, in quantum mechanics, this is not possible be, uh, because uh, we cannot know the position and momentum of a system or a particle with absolute accuracy and there is always a restriction imposed by the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If the uncertainty in measuring the position is say del q and the uh, momentum is del p then their product you know uncertainty product is greater than or equal to s cross by 2 where s cross is the reduced Planck's constant and it is defined as h divided by 2 pi where h is the Planck's constant so we need a completely different mathematical apparatus to discuss quantum mechanics here we'll briefly talk about the bare essentials only to gain some confidence, we shall solve some problems in the next problem solving session. Moreover, I am not being very rigorously perfect while discussing certain concepts. So first of all, let me discuss some important postulates of quantum mechanics based on who is the whole quantum mechanics is based. So one of the basic postulates of quantum mechanics says that all you want to know about the system is contained in a complex wave function and this complex wave function is called wave function and the wave function contains all the information all the information of the system so the state of a quantum system is defined by this wave function which is a complex quantity and in a Hilbert space this wave function is represented can be represented by the so-called state vector and this is called k psi and this notation is due to Dirac it's called Dirac notation and this is called k and because psi of rt this wave function is complex so its complex conjugate would be denoted by psi star of rt and the corresponding quantity in the hilbert space or in dirac notation it would be denoted by this symbol here and this is called bra okay also it is known that this wave function if it has to be a valid uh, representation of the system then it has to be normalized and that means that this relation has to be satisfied that integral of modulus of psi of rt d tau the d tau is the volume that has to be equal to one and physically it means that the probability of finding the particle in the entire volume must be equal to unity and this quantity psi of rt gives the probability gives the probability of finding a particle
in a small volume element d tau small volume element d tau the corresponding normalization condition in Dirac notation would be simply this okay this is called the inner product or scalar product and that is equal to scalar product of the state vector with itself and this is the normalization condition in the Dirac notation now suppose uh, before making a measurement a quantum system could be considered to be in any arbitrary state say k psi okay this state psi can be expressed as a superposition of eigenstate accessible to the system so we can write any arbitrary k as a superposition of eigenstates like say phi 1 phi 2 and so on if we are talking about a n dimensional system that would be c n phi n for infinite dimensional system it will go on n will tends to infinity and this we can write it as a shortened notation as c i phi i here phi 1 phi this phi i is called eigen vector or it is called basis state or basis vector in fact uh, to give you an analogy as you know in classical mechanics uh, or in vector analysis you know that if suppose we have a vector in three dimension this vector can be uh, written in its component like this a x i cap i cap is the unit vector along x direction a y z cap z cap is the unit vector along y direction and a z k cap and k cap is the unit vector along the z direction so in three dimensional uh, space you need three unit vectors to define the vector in the similar spirit you can consider that in n dimensional hilbert space you need n number of eigenstates or the basis vectors to define a arbitrary uh, state vector say psi now it is interesting that all these basis vectors or the eigenvectors for example again giving the analogy here if you take i dot i i cap dot i cap is equal to one so and similarly if you take the product of scalar product of two vectors i cap j cap then you will get zero in the similar spirit again this vector phi one its scalar product with itself is equal to one so that means the phi one is normalized but two different state uh, eigenvectors say phi 1 and phi 2 their scalar product will give 0 and in integral notation this would be simply phi 1 star phi 1 d tau is equal to 1 and here it would be phi 1 star phi 2 d tau is equal to 0 and in shorthand notation i can combine both this as say phi i phi j the scalar product of two uh, eigenstates would be simply delta ij and delta ij is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and it is equal to 0 if i is not equal to j if a measurement is made the system shall collapse into one of the eigenstates okay so the probability would depend on this coefficient say c1 c2 for example say we are in an arbitrary state psi and if we make if we make a measurement then the probability that it will collapse into the eigenstate say phi 4 it would be given by the probability c4 mod square so in general the probability and this is a very important uh, aspect of the postulates that the probability that system is collapsing into an eigenstate 
say phi i from psi due to measurement due to measurement is expressed as say pi is the probability that you are going from the arbitrary state psi to the eigenstate phi i and its probability would be mods of this square uh, this scalar product mod square and if you calculate it you can show that this would be nothing but ci mod square another important postulate of quantum mechanics states that for every physically observable quantity in classical mechanics there is a corresponding operator in quantum mechanics for example if we have this position variable q in classical mechanics say for position q in classical mechanics we have the position operator q cap in quantum mechanics for momentum p in classical mechanics we have the momentum operator p cap in quantum mechanics and in coordinate representation we have it as i minus i s cross delta q and for energy e in classical mechanics we have the hamiltonian operator in quantum mechanics and so on as all the informations are contained in the wave function or the state vector psi one needs to act on it by appropriate operator to get the relevant information for example if i want to know the information about the energy of the system and when the system is represented by the state vector say psi then i have to operate on it by the hamiltonian operator then i will be able to know the information about the energy and generally i end up with a equation of this type and then this equation is known as the eigenvalue equation physically speaking what happens is that but this equation actually means that when i am operating on the state vector psi by the hamiltonian operator it amounts to making a measurement on the system uh, to get information about the energy so it would be basically an energy measurement whenever we have equation of this type say for a physically observable quantity a we have this operator a cap it operates on the state vector psi and if it pops out a value lambda which is a real quantity because the observable has to be measurable so the lambda has to be real and the system remains the i the state vector remains unaffected whenever this equation is there this kind of equation is called the eigenvalue problem or eigenvalue equation which i am sure all of you know this is the eigenvalue equation so in the case of this hamiltonian uh, here here this you see lambda is here the energy so it is a well known textbook problem to show that for the eigenvalue lambda to be real a has to be hermitian a must be this operator a must be hermitian now another important postulate says that the time evolution of the state vector psi the time evolution of it is given by the so called schrodinger equation and you know this schrodinger equation is this one time evolution of the state vector is given by the schrodinger equation and from this schrodinger equation one can immediately write that the state vector at an arbitrary time t is equal to e to the power minus i by h cross h of t psi of 0 and this particular operator this is an operator and this is known as the time evolution operator okay 
one very useful relation in quantum mechanics is the so-called completeness condition let me briefly remind you about it and it is very important relation completeness relation or sometimes it is called uh, closure relation also as you know uh, any arbitrary state vector state vector say ket alpha in the hilbert space can be expanded in terms of the eigens eigen case of a hermitian operator say a uh, then i can write it as a superposition of this eigen states say i ket i and these are the coefficients okay now if i multiply both sides of this equation by bra j okay let me do that if i apply both sides then this is a number ci and i have here ji because these are now eigen vector or basis vectors so i can impose the condition that this is equal to delta ji and this is kronecker delta and from here i get it as cj so this implies that this coefficient ci i can write it as i alpha okay inner product of i and alpha so i can now write ket alpha as summation in in in, uh, in the place of ci i let me write this quantity this is a number okay and i have it here because it is a number i can take it to the other side so if i do that i can write it as i i alpha okay so this means it is very clear that this summation this outer product of this uh, eigen vectors uh, this is actually an identity operator and this is known as the completeness condition you can see the utility of the completeness condition when we try to represent an operator in the matrix form let us do that say we have this operator a then i can multiply both sides of this operator by an identity so let me write the first identity as summation of this outer product sum of the outer products of ket i then i have this a and here it would be sum of the outer products of ket j so i can do that now i can write it as if i just write only one summation but actually it is double summation so uh, in shorten notation i can write it in this way so then i have i i a j j now you see this is just a number so i can write it here also i a z i z there are all together n square there are all together n square numbers of form i a z where n is the dimensionality of the ket space of ket space so we may arrange them into an n by n square matrix such that uh, the column and the row indices appears as follows so i have this uh, form here this would be row and this would be column let me illustrate it a uh, little bit more clearly so we will have a n by n matrix for this operator a so we will have say 1 a 
one so this is i can write go on writing the first this uh, bra side here represents the row first row and the, this gate side represents the column so i have here one two and then i have one a three and so on and here i will have this second row a this is the first column this is the second row second column second row third column and so on and then here i will have third row first column third row second column actually it's sorry it would be yeah and then you'll have third row third column and so on so we'll have a total uh, n by n uh, if it is n dimensional then you will have n square uh, elements this can be written in shortened notation as a11 a12 a13 then you'll have a21 a22 a23 you'll have a31 a32 a33 a34 and so on i hope you are getting the idea you will have a big matrix depending on the dimension okay we'll uh, give you some example uh, let me give an example right away uh, consider a spin half system as an example consider a spin half system and you know a spin half system is a two-dimensional system because uh, it has two eigenstate one is the spin up state spin up state which is denoted by say in this notation get uh, up state or sometimes people write it as plus this get this sign represents that the spin is in the up state and uh, in, because it is a two uh, two state system so this can be written uh, represented by this column vector one zero and another st state on the uh, the other state is the spin down spin down state is represented in this notation and uh, or obviously by this minus get minus here and the column vector would be zero one it has to be like this because as you will see that these are the kth states so this has to be normalized this is the eigenstate and this is also an eigen another eigenstate so they have to be normalized and if you write it as one zero this is the bra and it will be one zero here and here it would be one zero this is the column and if you take the multiplication if you do the matrix multiplication immediately you will see you will get one and you will have minus minus then here you will have zero one and here you have zero one and this is also going to give you one on the other hand if you take the scalar product of these two different eigenstates you can immediately see that it would be one zero and this would be zero one and if you take the matrix multiplication it will be zero so this clearly shows that k plus and k minus are orthogonal similarly you will have minus plus is going to give you here to be zero one and here to be one zero and you will again get zero so what about the completeness condition recall that the completeness condition was this so in this case we have it is two dimensional so the k vectors are plus plus and you have minus minus and this would be identity matrix and you can check it that you will get actually one zero zero one the identity matrix two by two matrix you will get okay suppose uh, we have an eigenvalue equation for the spin half system such that if i have an operator say as that it if it operates on the up state then it gives us the eigenvalue h cross by 2 plus h cross by 2 and if it operates on the eigenstate 
minus that is the down state we get the eigenvalue minus s cross by 2 then we can very easily express as z so now we can express as z in the matrix form so it would be very easy because we have it is a it would be a 2 by 2 matrix so elements would be you have plus as z plus and here you'll have this is your row okay this is your row this is column so this will be plus as z minus and here you'll have minus as z plus and you'll have minus as z minus and now you can work it out because we have s z plus equal uh, when it operates on it we are having s cross by 2 plus if i multiply both sides by the bra plus here then i will get s z plus and here it would be h cross by 2 this is what i will get and this is normalized so you'll have simply h cross by 2 again if i do minus s z if I multiply it by the minus of this bra, then what I will get? You will get s cross by 2 minus plus and this is orthogonal. So therefore, you will get 0. Similarly, you can show that you will have say plus s z minus that would be equal to 0. And you will have minus s z minus this will give you minus s cross by 2. So therefore the matrix representation of this operator would be then here you will have h cross by 2 here it would be 0 0 minus s cross by 2 which also you can write it as s cross by 2 1 0 0 minus 1 many a times we would prefer to work in a particular basis states over that of the other ones just like in classical mechanics Sometimes using spherical polar coordinates is more useful or easy to work on than the Cartesian coordinate system. For example, in classical mechanics, whenever in a particular problem there is spherical symmetry in the problem, then we prefer to use the spherical polar coordinate say r theta phi rather than Cartesian coordinate x, y, z and we can go from cartesian coordinate system to the spherical polar coordinate system by the so-called coordinate transformation in the similar spirit in quantum mechanics uh, we can go from the basis state say phi n to a new basis states phi n dash or vice versa and we can do that by using a transformation called unitary transformation by unitary transformation we ensure that the probability is conserved that means that uh, we must have uh, these conditions that scalar product has to be equal to one which is you know the normalization condition and uh, while we go from uh, this say uh, old coordinate to new coordinate this has to be maintained the scalar product has to be equal to one so this is what we mean by uh, unitarity and this is uh, ensured by unitarity of the transformation matrix unitarity of transformation matrix ensures it let me elaborate. Uh, let me write, say, we have this eigenstate phi n, which I can write because of the completeness condition. Now I can write it as phi m dash phi m dash. These are basis states. And this is what I have. I can always do that because I know that this is the identity operator. This I can write slightly uh, differently. I can write it because you see this is just a number. So I can write it as phi m dash phi n 
phi f dash and if i write it as summation over n this is if i write it as u m n phi m dash where u m n is the matrix element of the unitary operator where i go from the old basis state phi n to a new basis state say phi m dash okay let me show that u is u is unitary to prove it uh, i just need to show because u is a unitary matrix so you know that a matrix is unitary u is unitary provided u u dagger is equal to identity operator u dagger is the uh, hermitian uh, operator corresponding to the operator u so now let me prove it i have u u dagger if i multiply uh, if i take this relation let me work it out phi m phi n if i can actually prove that this is equal to delta m n then uh, it will ensure that u is unitary okay i will show this later i can write it as phi m and ut utilizing the completeness condition let me put here another basis states say phi l like this and we have u dagger phi n this then i can write it as summation over l i can write it as u m l u star of nl where i defined uml is equal to this is the matrix element of this unitary operator u phi m phi l and u nl star is equal to phi l u dagger phi n which is actually phi n u phi l and if i take the complex conjugate now we have u m l this is uh, going from the old basis state say phi l to going to the new basis state phi m dash as per our this definition who is here this one you note utilizing that i can write uml like this and unl star i can write it as phi l phi n dash okay so therefore i can write sum over this quantity uh, i can write it as uml unl star is equal to this i have phi m dash phi l phi l phi n dash and as you can see okay let me write here I can write it as phi m dash summation over l phi l phi l and here i have phi n dash and this is identity operator so i will have phi m dash phi n dash so this is the scalar product in the new basis and and we know that this is nothing but delta Kronecker delta mn so clearly we now have therefore proved that phi m u u dagger phi n is equal to delta mn
what it means that that this matrix uh, u u dagger is equal to identity operator and which means that u is a unitary matrix u is unitary if some of you are finding this particular portion difficult please don't worry we will work out a set of example problems in the problem solving session which would surely boost your confidence let me stop here for today in the next lecture we will start the course please note that you will get some supplementary materials time to time these are there to help those students who have forgot the basics or those who want to understand certain topics more clearly also please note that if i make some mistakes in the lecture materials they would be rectified in the problem solving sessions i hope you will enjoy the course see you in the next lecture thank you